Inside the Eye Live, where we break down some of the weekly mainstream media talking points before the talking points even get aired. Add in some entertaining stories, weather, cats, intriguing and informative guests, and you get one of the most listened to Saturday morning streaming media political talk shows going today. And it's all right here on our flagship station, Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So join me, the Fetch, for Inside the Eye Live every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock a.m. Eastern. It is truly intelligent media for the politically aware. Welcome to Sacred Matrix, a divine paradigm of love and universal consciousness, with your host, Janet Kira Lesson and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Together we transform the world. And now, here are your hosts, Janet Kira and Dr. Sasha Lesson. Hello, hi everyone. And welcome to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I'm your host, Janet Kira Lesson, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson. And our very special guest today is Brett Luter. And Brett received his bachelor's degree in journalism from Chico State University in 2000. Since then, he has gone on to write roughly 700 articles on music, alternative history, spirituality, and UFOs for such magazines as Magical Blend Magazine, UFO Magazine, Reggae Festival Guide, and the Chico News and Review, among many others. He has written two books. The first is Song in Your Heart, the story of the search for the lost note, volume one, in a three-part series titled The Esoteric Guide to the Reggae Vibe Series illustrating the role of the roots reggae rasta in terms of a global struggle for human consciousness. Volume 2, Tales of a Heavy Heart, UFOs, Magic, and Impending Doom is due out, oh, it's, yeah, due out in late 2016. In his most recent book, A UFO Hunter's Guide by Wiser in Books in San Francisco, Luter breaks down the muddled field of ecology into possible chunks, both highlighting the field's infamous history and the context with which a ufologist finds themselves today. Unlike any book in the market, it even includes tips from the pros, as many of today's top investigators contributed key facets of many techniques, approaches, and strategies pertinent for the investigator. Luter has also produced two double-disc DVD sets of interviews with speakers from the Bay Area UFO Expo titled The Esoteric Guide to the Bay Area UFO Expos, Volumes 1 and 2. And we met Brett, oh, last month when we were in, in San Sacramento and had a really good time hanging out with him. Before we bring him on, I want Dr. Lesson to say a few words. Well, we're very uh, hot to hear what you've got to say, especially about doom. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, we want to uh, have a good to uh, uplift to the end of the show but brett it's so good to have you on the show welcome to our show oh thank you so much you guys what a pleasure it is to be here i really appreciate the opportunity how's it going oh it's going great um so we i I didn't get the chance to read your books but you we have an opportunity here for you to tell us some of the things that you have covered and that you did give me some q and questions to ask you, but where do you want to start? Do you want to say anything extra to our listeners about yourselves before we, yourself, before we dive into the subject matter for today? Um, well, I'm just a journalist. Um, I've had a number of interesting experiences over the years since I got out of college and, uh, shoot, I think I got my a degree in 2000, but I think I was in there for a couple of years, finishing up a couple of classes that were pending. But, mm-hmm. um, since then, since I've gotten into UFOs and stuff, uh, I've interviewed, boy, you name it, from uh, Rinpoches from Tibet to 
Native American shaman of a number of different tribes to Druid priests, um, uh, Catholic priests, you name it. Um, and uh, I got to tell you, uh, the line seems to be blurred between what a journalist is and what an experiencer is. Um, as you know, that event uh, that you just mentioned at UFO Con in Sacramento uh, mm -hmm. was an experiencer's theme. And um, boy, listening to some of those stories, uh, uh, you gotta you gotta look at oneself. I look at myself and go like, wow, you know, maybe maybe some of those things I I have seen qualify as an experience, you know. Um, but I'm just a journalist. I'm, I'm uncovering what I think is as the truth, at least as what I see. Um, and that's reflected in both my books. Uh, and, um, you know, I think like a, uh, investigator has to become part of its prey in order to catch it, a police investigator. I think a UFO investigator to some degree falls into that category as well. The deeper you study this phenomena, uh, I think the more you become connected to it in one way or another. At least that's what I, I seem to be finding. So... So I think that's what I want to say before we talk about the books. That's that's why I've written the books is because of this seeming um, focused growth. As soon as you think about it, it grows. You know, is that reflective of our reality? You, our thoughts do create the future. Is that what's going on, or is there something? Is there that maybe plus something else? So anyway, the topic of UFOs is fascinating. So we could talk all night. Yeah, we find a lot of investigators get into investigating because they are contactees and it's not till way down the line they uncover that the, you know something has been going on that triggered their response to get involved investigating the subject in the first place and I'm getting a little bit of feedback here I'm not sure what's uh, going on there are, is that me? I don't know <laughs> anyway we'll, we'll work our way past it I'm not sure if it's our end or your end we're, we're going to be quiet area here so but who knows anyway, okay around it um so what would you like to tell me about your reporting you know you said you were an investigator and uh, reported to, uh, you interviewed all these different people the shaman and the sure thing, and then you said that there was some similarities between that and experiencers can you tell us a little bit more on that elaborate on that well, I think as a journalist, you fall into that category of an investigator where the more you delve into a subject, the more the subject becomes a part of yourself. Um, and, you know, that's where we get the so-called expert, right? They study okay. a subject for so long, so many years, and then all of a sudden it's like just a part of them. They can talk about any facet of it uh, at the drop of a hat. Um, I think that's what's happened. Uh, I think that's what happens with people that start to study any subject. But when you talk about UFOs, this is a particularly interesting subject because when that happens to you, you seem to be connected in to possibly what many consider to be other races of beings. Mm -hmm. And um, whether the research creates the kind of vibration that maybe these beings are looking for, and so that's kind of a, a tripwire for them to pay attention to you, I'm not sure, but that's definitely a theory that I've played around with. Um, and uh, I think also, too, I just got through reading Sherry Wilde's book, uh, The Forgotten Promise. Mm -hmm. and, and in that book, she describes a story where these three men in black approach her, scare the bejesus out of her, and then give a warning to her investigator, Don Schmidt, that, uh, you know, we're not going to let some small-time investigator ruin our generational research on your family. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so, you, you know, we're... The ufologist is just the little guy, really, in terms of uh, the investigative world, right? You got the police investigators and and private investigators, that kind of thing, that are more publicly known. But you get into to ufology, and um, it's just it just gets strange. Let's just <laughs> we can just leave that at that. So um, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but oh, uh, I don't know. It doesn't matter. We're just talking. <laughs> <laughs> I don't need a, a specific answer. Sasha, something to say. Go ahead. Just from the point of view of a psychotherapist, we don't. I'm not concerned with the ontological or reality status of people's um, projections or uh, things they access. What I really am concerned with is the part of them that accesses these experiences and how that integrates uh, with the rest of their life and their ability to center themselves and to 
own that part and to uh, not kill the other parts just because they have a part that uh, has uh, paranormal experiences. Yeah, you know, it's a fascinating subject. The psychological approach seems to have certain advantages uh, if you're talking about a contacting experience or an abduction experience. But then again, you know, if you if you trust uh, contacting testimony, uh, then it would seem to have some disadvantages because a, a psychologist psychological point of view seems to not want to incorporate other dimensions, that kind of thing, into it. Um, uh yeah, it's a fascinating I, I discussion that, about what happens to them. Yeah, go ahead. That's the academic uh, psychologist, but uh, a person that's tr tracking uh, in a Jungian fashion, as I do, uh, uh, another person's uh, what they access doesn't have the uh, judgments about, doesn't care about whether the uh, uh, contact uh, alien uh, is uh, what kind of ship they have, or this or that, or the other thing. We just want to get the story from the person's perspective, and uh, we get information incidentally, but we don't drive the interview in terms of our research subject. We track the person, carry along with them in terms of their, their needs to uh, experience these parts of themselves. Wow, this noise is terrible on our end. I don't know if you can yeah, hear it. I can hear it. Switch it to uh, our phone, perhaps. I'll help. But anyway, let's keep talking to resolve this. Um, okay, you let me know what you want to do. Yeah, we're, we're working on it. Okay, there it okay. goes. <laughs> uh, okay, what was I going to say? Okay, so I'm an experiencer. Okay, here, I'm getting some feedback. He's saying, oh, the, the feedback is from the studio itself. So he can reconnect it. Do you want to do that, Sean? That's um, that's okay with us if you want to reconnect. So that sounds better there. There. Way better. Whatever you did just worked. <laughs> yeah, sounds great now. Okay, so I'm an experiencer, and I was blessed to meet Dr. Lesson, and he was able to facilitate my process. He doesn't fix, repair, judge, or try to, you know, lead me, lead the witness in any way, shape, or form. And as a um, being facilitated by a professional, professional who uh, is of that mind and doesn't do those things, I was able to go very deep, and I'm still going deep into this process of what it's like to be a lifelong contact the experiencer. And we keep getting more and more information every day. And as I open up and I contact other contactees. Uh, we're all getting pieces of the puzzle. It's just uh, amazing what's going on there. So I, I invite you to, you know, perhaps be part of some of these discussion panels because somebody has to do, like yourself, a, uh, you know, an unbiased reporter, be open-minded enough to, to look at this information and perhaps, uh, you know, catalog it and put it into some kind of format which we could get out to the world at large because I think this is a grand spiritual awakening and so that's your first question can ufology be considered a spiritual pursuit for me my ufology uh, experience or information is very spiritual what have you found ah. well that's exactly what I found um, I'm not as interested in uh, the kinds of craft or the propulsion systems or how they got here um, although that is fascinating, uh, I'm, I quickly, as a journalist, reading on my own path, reading, uh, let's say, a lot of Wendell Stevens' books, as, a, as an example. He's a great uh, place to learn how to become an investigator, read his books. They're just fundamental. They're simple, straightforward. He covers all of his bases. Um, but even with a, a, a thorough investigation like uh, that, like what Wendell Stevens did say with the Billy Myers case or many other cases that he's written about, uh, you begin a th to recognize a theme and that this theme is that the humans seem to be at the center of this. Um, whether they're scaring the bejesus out of you and testing your own one's own resolve, which is in the end good for one's growth, to be able to stand in the presence of these beings and not soil your shorts, so to speak, metaphorically speaking, of course. Um, uh, that in itself is a huge growth thing. I experienced that 
with some Sasquatch experiences in central Washington. I think we talked about that last time I was on the show. But, uh, but there's deeper levels. Uh, there's spiritual levels, which with these, these beings communicate with us. Um, <clears throat> many of the contactees refer to uh, these beings as godlike and that they are overwhelmed by the levels of love that they feel when they're in the presence of these beings. Yet there's this kind of weird scenario where contact happens and there's a fear factor. Uh, the, the, the look of these beings themselves is questionable. If they're, if they're really trying to, to work with us and help us, if they're really our friends, and they have this superior technology of shape shifting, which is alleged by many species. Many researchers allege that about uh, the different kinds of aliens that are alleged to be out there. Um, then they could present us with a much better form than a gray alien. Um, that seems to scare the you know what out of people. Um, in in uh, Sh- again Sherry Wilde's book, I just finished that a couple days ago. Mm-hmm. Really good story. She really has suffered a lot, like a lot of contactees. Uh, she she made the reference that that uh, there is this connection with them to some kind of a darkness because of the terror that they put people through. Maybe in the end, we are just lab rats to them, and they really don't have anything personal against us. But the prodding and the poking that seems so cold, and uh, the testing, whatever, the the taking in the middle of the night, uh, or in the middle of, shoot, I read a Bud Hopkins book where a whole family was taken out of a park in broad daylight in front of everybody and put back right in the same time. And the only reason why they knew that happened is because some other family was taking a picture right at the same time and this red beam was caught by this other family's camera coming down um, mm-hmm. over the family that was taken. So, I mean, they have, they have such infinite power, it would appear to us, that, that worrying about the technology or trying to catch up with them on technology would not seem to be a sound strategy if we're really going to try to figure this out and that really only leaves one place to go and that's us it's inside us the answer is inside us and so again while it's fascinating to discuss the nuts and bolts and the different shapes I think there's a a poster on the website now with like a hundred different shapes on it incredible poster um, I may have seen a couple of those that are represented there but in the end that doesn't really matter because you get put into some kind of a trance you're taken and they do stuff to you and the implication is either that you agreed to it in some pre-life soul contract or you're being taken against your will and which one it is I'm not quite sure yet all I know is I have a handful of cases where I'm trying to help these women try to stop what's happening to them and um, so that's kind of where I'm at today. So, so well, that's the, interesting. The... Yeah, I'd like to talk yeah. a little bit about what you just said before we go into the next thing. <clears throat> so, part of it when you when we talk when you talk about all this, I think of what my my cat thinks of the you know when I take her to the vet <laughs> or something. And so we might be having some of that phenomenon. We're just uh, we right. kill our victims. We we have no idea what's going on. We're, we're being taken somewhere. To me, in my experience, is what I've uncovered is that the gray seem to be some kind of delivery system. They, they, they pick you up and they return you, but they, there's things that happen in between with other beings uh, that seem to be in charge and have not, not greater intelligence, but perhaps a little bit more empathy. It's kind of like encountering, you remember Data from Star Trek? He's always sure. trying to <laughs> develop emotions. Well, these grays, um, I, I think what we're feeling is the lack of emotions that is coming from them and that feels so horrible to us because we're used to you know beings having some kind of soul and some kind of even even animals say animals have strong emotional responses to their external world and stimuli so I think we're experiencing that I'm reminded what you're talking about is how Whitley Stryver I think it was his book um, Secret School one of those books it wasn't the first one but I read the whole series excuse me and he said that he had to learn how to be with them. So he was in his cabin in upstate New York, and he, he felt them 
in, in the house, right? Because you, you can feel them. It's like a barometric pressure. You can feel them. They open portals. Anybody that's halfway sensitive can feel them. So he knew they were coming and they were in the living room. So his bedroom was upstairs and he would try to get out of bed. And it took him years. Eventually he got out of bed and he got to the top of the stairs and he kept jumping back in bed, running afraid. And his wife was thinking she's, he's nuts. And then eventually he got halfway down the stairs and he would run back. And then he got he got downstairs and he eventually uh, trained himself not to have that fight or flight response and sat across. He saw a uh, a gray type. I don't even know what the description was. Some kind of alien. I think it was in the gray family of some kind. But it was sitting there in lotus in meditation. And then he eventually learned how to go and sit right opposite him in lotus in meditation. <laughs> and he trained himself from uh, not having that fight or flight. A fear-based response. So for me as an experience, I go, is that really my crap or is that something they're doing to me? So I've learned to witness it and analyze it and I have trained myself to actually be very curious rather than frightened and fearful curious. So do you have something you want to add to that? Okay. So so you're working with some uh, they're predominantly women, and, and say that again. Uh, they want to stop the encounters, right? What kind of yeah, that's, are you that's giving correct. Them? Right. Well, they they come back with marks on their body or uh, slime on their body. Um, they're they're returned extremely tired, um, drained, in some cases. And um, you know, we've I've read Andrew Fell's book, and and there's a few other uh, things strategies out there. Nothing seems to really work for this one particular lady uh, in the Bay Area who I, I've recently gotten permission to write about in my next book, um, although I can't say her name. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want her name. Yeah, and so, uh, you know, she lives next to a military base, and the implication is that she's being taken by something, and um, she claims to have been shown uh, multiple hybrid babies on a ship that were hers, supposedly. Um, she was told the name of one of them. She got to meet one of them. And so, uh, then she comes back and we think the military's taken her in what's, we now know as a my lab or military abduction and then debriefed. And so we, we can't really figure out, um, how, how to put a stop to it. Um, I think, uh, the thing that's been tested the most now, uh, which may seem odd to some people. Uh, is a, by a guy named Joe Jordan. He's a former Florida State MUFON director. And uh, the story I have is that he stopped being a MUFON director because the evidence he was getting didn't seem to fit into MUFON's uh, paradigm. And the evidence he was getting was that more and more people were coming forward and saying they were shouting out the name of Jesus Christ, and that would stop their abduction cold. Um, in some cases, people were halfway through, floating through a wall, and they'd sit, and instantly they were back in their bed, and the darkness was gone, and the tension was gone. The fear was gone. And, you know, so that just brings up this whole point. Well, so is that what's going on with all these people? Is it, is it really, are they dark? Are the grays really dark? I think there's evidence to suggest that they are. Well, at the same time, there's evidence to suggest that they're just maybe a more advanced being treating us like a lab rat, which ethically okay. would have its own issues to a spiritual being. But right. I'd much prefer that than have them be the, what's classically known as a demon. Okay, let um, me let me address that a little bit. Scary. Let's flesh that out a little bit more. Sure. And Sasha, be, chime in anytime you want to, because I know you know a lot about this. So the so they're having these experience. Like, I think it's just uh, they symbol it the way they symbol it. So you, if you're, you know, perhaps uh, have a different mindset. What I do is I I throw myself a white light and I say I forbid you for taking me from taking me and that works so maybe they're just evoking Jesus Christ because that's part of their their own paradigm of, of a higher power and it, you just need to, Could be. to test this like if you if you evoke uh, you know Buddha does it work as well as Jesus Christ you would have to really kind of test this we're gonna have this group evoke Jesus and this group evoke you know, right somebody else so we don't know if it's Jesus that working we don't know if it's darkness that's at play here that these are evil dark beings maybe they're just responding to you saying no and just because you say no in the name of Jesus it might just be that you need to say I forbid you you know for take me so that would mean that's probably not human there might be some kind of screen memory that they're projecting that this is a human being because they're responding to the 
you know, I forbid you. I don't think some military guy is going to just drop, you know, some woman because she says, I forbid you from taking me. So that's, that's <laughs> my thing. What do you think, Dr. Lisson? Well, it depends a lot upon the person's uh, ideology, but the, the Baldwin method that, that I often use uh, is you say, you know, uh, I, you first access the part of the person that is making contact uh, with the uh, the strange being and, and uh, interview it. Then we ask the being that's uh, taking it over or uh, uh, interfering with it, uh, to use the person's voice, uh, but not take them over. And I uh, converse with this being using the person, uh, the patient, as a medium uh, t until we find out what that uh, being is doing. And if they say, I'm, I'm here to uh, stifle your light, uh, and after a while, uh, and why are you doing that, and who sent you, and so forth, you say, I call on the Archangel Michael and the uh, guardians of light to cast a net about over this little one and all its uh, affiliates in uh, all the networks of my patient uh, uh, and uh, cast a net around all of them and 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 we're going to now ask you to uh, look inside and see that you too are of the light and, and once they do that uh, you say now it's time for you to return to your uh, appointed place in the light that's appropriate for you and to leave this person. Do you have anything you want to say to them? And there's usually a big emotional thing in the dialogue and then you say, are you ready to go? And, and then they say, go now to the, your place in the light and there's this great feeling of relief that um, particularly Christians uh, have with this thing. And I don't think the Jesus thing would, would work so, so well in, uh, in Arab or, or Jewish countries actually. Well, so those haven't been tested. Janet's right. A series of tests would have to be done on different names or phrases or words um, to see what would produce to be the best. All I know is that Joe Jordan is the only guy that's done any kind of study like that, and he's done it with the name of Christ. Mm -hmm. Now, it's a really good point. Do you have to be a Christian to use it? Would, would that name work in Middle Eastern countries? Well, I'm not sure. I haven't ex extended my studies that far yet. But Jesus is, is found in the name is found in the Quran far more than Muhammad's. Mm. So, oh, okay. actually, you're, you're quite right. Uh, Jesus is, is also known to have gone to India. Uh, and, That's right. And and uh, to af actually have died in Afghanistan. And, uh, and so uh, Jesus is very well known. But a lot of the things that I found when I was working with uh, Stan Groff and holotropic breathwork and uh, and theogenic uh, facilitation is that people would access sages across uh, lines uh, they suddenly they'll uh, on a in a deep trip they'll see hey there's this blue guy and he's playing a flute you know to describe Krishna or uh, and and it's like these are universal archetypes uh, which probably are resonating on uh, real forces in in uh, in any case it doesn't matter it's what uh, whether to what degree they're real what matters and separate from the individual because the idea of separation between the individual and all these thought forms is just a, a intellectual convenience anyhow. We're all part of the same thing. And, and I won't argue with any word of that. Um, <laughs> I would just say that there are cases like, uh, let's say, the, um, the Amityville horror movie was based on a case by uh, Elizabeth and Ed Warren, who were two exorcists on the East Coast. And... Uh, uh, the, the uh, Exorcist of Emily Rose is another movie that depicting some of these heinous things that, while you might be correct in the end that it's some kind of thought form, but there is if, if you're right, and I'm not saying you're wrong, I'm staying open to all possibilities because I'm not sure I know what it is, but if you're right, then there is a certain kind of thought form that can act like what traditionally around the world or in certain cultures is called a demon. And if that's the case, it's not simply a matter of just changing your thoughts or getting rid of a thought form, because this thought form now, if under your scenario, has grown out of control. Um, we've seen this in the Montauk book, the Montauk Project book yes. by Preston Nichols and uh, Peter Moon, where Duncan Cameron unleashed the beast. Okay, so on the one hand, while you're, I think, it's very likely that you're right, looking at the possibilities as to what a demon could be. Um, there is a form of those thoughts 
that seem to be out of control for the average, even skilled thought practitioner, a shaman or or a priest. And it seems to be that, that it takes a, styly, a culturally stylized set of protocols to keep these things under wraps. And so when I look at, for example, the name of Jesus to be used as a remedy for this kind of a thing, to repel negative energy or a dark being that's trying to possess you, whatever the case may be, I see it in that name in all three major religions. I see that name in Ascended Master traditions. You just rattled off, uh, Dr. Sasha, uh, a bunch of different things. I forget exactly what those were, but you put all that stuff together. Jesus is a main figure of the Arantia tradition. So when you put all these things together, this that name is global. And so personally, I don't feel like you have to be a Christian, quote-unquote Christian, to use it. I think what this is... And this is my early conclusion, but it's not, there's still work to be done sh for sure. Because I'm not sure I really know what any of this stuff really is. I'm just looking for patterns, okay? <laughs> what I think is that G the name Jesus is a tool that's been given to humans that when, um, metaphorically speaking, when the stuff hits the wall, when it hits the fan, and there's nowhere else to turn, in other words, when we've expired our requirements for what we're responsible here on earth in the physical body, when we can no longer take it further than what we can in our physical body, we call on the name and boom. And I'll, I'll tell you, I've been experimenting with this myself. And most recently, it happened when I got pulled over um, by the notoriously uh, uh, criminal and violent cops in our area. I'm in Northern California, Butte County. And... Uh, Boy, I, it just the first thing that came out of my mouth was, Jesus, please don't let me get uh, a ticket to go to jail. I have some traffic issues that are pending. And this guy came up to me and cracked a joke, told me to slow down and left. He, not only did he not ask me for my ID, he didn't even run my plate. Otherwise, I very well wouldn't have gotten away. So does that prove anything 100%? No, I don't think it does. But all we can do as humans is try to test it. And so that's what I try to tell people now is test it. Okay? Yeah, in, in a way, it's like, like, like with the archetype of, of, of the uh, um, enlightened person, uh, Jesus, is within all of us. And, and this is a, a well-known uh, way of, uh, of basically a person that's saying, uh, help the unfortunate, revere women, uh, love instead of war. And uh, that, that archetype, call it Jesus, call it my higher self, whatever, or is grail tradition. inherent in the human condition, I think. Yeah, it's, it's the grail tradition, right? Mm -hmm. Chivalry and honor and, and what it means to be human in, with awareness of the universe and your soul. Um, I agree 100%. Um, now, how this plays into UFOs, I think, is very fascinating because I think the Gnostics maybe have the best description, although there's varying descriptions, but the, that's the fall of the feminine and and how other beings in God's many mansions are playing a role in the both the, the constant or the continuance of the suppression as opposed to those that are trying to raise up the feminine and bring balance to humanity and society. And so I think that's another... I, I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, okay, I, go it's, ahead. It's not just... It's not just the military that's doing it, but it's the, the basically the Nazis who have uh, infiltrated our Operation Paperclip, our, uh, the sure. CIA. I, I, I did an interview with an extensive talk with Monique Lawson, who rescues children from, there's this group of the CIA operatives that, whose job it is to kidnap uh, children uh, for sacrifice and sexual pleasure of the, uh, uh, the Catholic hierarchy and the big shots that run this planet. And so it isn't just the military. It's it's uh, parts of the clandestine government and the uh, uh, the uh, chiefs of the great corporations that rule this planet as well that are involved in uh, abductions. And they may cover it up with uh, uh, other kinds of stories, but it's kidnapping and murder from my perspective. Right. So I guess we have to look at the whole abduction phenomenon. I mean, how can one get abducted? Who's abducting? Well, what kind of energies would uh, would Jesus work against everybody and everything as an archetype? Uh, we actually we're going to do a Christmas special on who is Jesus. There, there's a whole group of us that believe that Jesus is uh, 
an Anunnaki. So maybe there's some power there uh, with the Anunnaki. And uh, it's a fascinating subject. But, it really but, is. Okay, you, you were talking about the feminine. That, that's one of the major problems with the entire planet. It's, it's the inner and outer masculine and feminine that are out of balance. So um, when you balance it externally, you, you balance it internally, and you bring the whole planet back into balance. So that is something that we're not making much, much progress with as a society, especially even now it seems like we're going backwards in our uh, freedom and basic human civil rights for women. And I'm a woman, I'm just appalled um, where the, it's going. And uh, so that's a whole subject in itself. Uh, I want to take you into this. Um, we talked a little bit about entheogens and the, uh, the I always say shamanism and you're saying shamanism. I, I hear it both ways, but I, I've been trained to call it shamanism and Jacques Vallée and uh, Terence McKenna was actually a personal friend of, of Dr. Lessons. He lived on the Big Island and um, they visited each other's houses several times. So uh, are you are we finished with this part? Do we have some more things to conclude and then we can go on to shamanism and, and those types of things? Whatever. They're all related, so whatever. Okay. So let's go to the next topic. Definition of shamanism and the works of Jacques Vallée and Terence McKenna. What would you like to say about those things in your research? What are you discovering? Uh, well, uh, you know, you just hit this central issue on nail on the head right there. Shamanism is really the knowledge or higher knowledge of oneself uh, and the protocols used to access these different aspects of our soul or spirit or consciousness, however you want to look at it. And when you're dealing with UFOs, that's exactly what's happening. They're putting you into this like dreamlike state. Uh, where uh, they're clouding your memory, maybe implanting screen memories. And um, these interactions, and especially you're aware of this, reading the Strieber series, that um, <clears throat> it's, uh, it's been described as a difference in vibration, um, and we have to get acclimated to it uh, for some reason, whatever the case may be. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, for me... If, if something really wants to communicate with us that's good, you know, just be straightforward. That's the, it's the universal laws, right? You just say hello, uh, maybe bring a gift. That always seems to work well when I go to a stranger's house. Um, and, you, and you say hi. You sit down, maybe break some bread or have some kind of a meeting place where both can be comfortable and you talk. And I don't see that really happening and yet I see a lot of people that are really willing to do that, if that's the case. So the fact that they're clandestine, that's a huge red flag for me. Um, uh, but again, if we knew ourselves better as a human species, there may be some individuals that are really advanced, that know themselves really well. I'm working on it myself. I'm not so sure I know what I am yet or what my powers are. Although I've read about Merkabahs and levitation and stuff like that, interdimensional travel. Um, but uh, <clears throat> it's, the, it's because we don't know who we are. It's because of these shamanic techniques we're only kept to the few leaders of the, of the tribes um, and not maybe more widely known that uh, these techniques that these ETs use are, are able to work on us. That's what I think. Um, and I think if, we, if a human being actually knew their full power, say like uh, Neo in uh, The Matrix 3, where he can just stop all the stuff around him, control his external life or external environment, like Lucy maybe from from that recent, more recent movie. Yeah, I saw that. Um, that was a good movie. Yeah, uh, and uh, if that's what our true human powers are, then there's no way any kind of a form of government can allow humanity to get to that stage because it undermines... See, all the governments now have a life of their own, and they're gone if that happens if everyone becomes their own gods and can w live in harmony well that destroys the uh the teat that these uh certain small amount of humans which arguably are backed by certain et factions have been sucking on for what looks to me like thousands of years maybe since ancient samaria at least to be conservative so well i think you hit the nail on the head once again <laughs> That uh, And I have had, as a tantrika, who's gone deep into the studies, the shamanic practices, the uh, activation of the kundalini energy and re 
connecting with source. Uh, yes, they, they need to be afraid, be very afraid if we become conscious on that level. Uh, I have opened hailing frequencies personally, and I've been in groups where we've done that, and we get the high uh, communication all the way up to source and contact with extraterrestrials. You can you can have conscious contact when you you know really learn how to master these tools and awaken your own energy systems, your Kundalini, and reactivate your DNA. So that's why they they took our DNA and they rendered 256 strands. Uh, inert in the off position so we don't have these abilities. However, what's happening now is more and more people are able to turn it back on. Dr. Liss wants to say well, just the, uh, the Anunnaki, um, who are people like us, uh, are in the kind of contact that you're mentioning where they will, where you can uh, address them, you can talk to them intelligently. There's some that are public, like uh, Michael Lee Hill, who's the embodiment of Enki, uh, the Anunnaki scientist and uh, Supreme uh, David Rockefeller, who uh, is uh, in direct contact with Marduk, and there's a number of Anunnaki who will talk to uh, specific people, very much like the Adamski uh, uh, meetings, where there are people and they'll talk just exactly like you're you're saying, and it's very very different than a uh, uh, an abduction against your will. It's a invitation to talk and to help the planet. Right. I think I that that's what true. you said earlier is that you have to learn how to perceive it differently, that you're not the victim, you know, like at the like the animal at the vet, but you're actually meeting them on the same equal par and then they know how to meet you. If you're just cowering and, and terrified, they they can't get past your own uh, energy shields. So back to you, Brett. I, uh, I experienced that during my time with Kiwani lapsaritis in central Washington a few years back. And um, the way I understood it was that the Bigfoot didn't like to be around humans that were all fearful because um, for the same reason why, let's say, a human is uncomfortable being around a, a dog that's real skittish. Um, it's just like, well, okay, I don't really want to pet you. You look like you could bite me. Maybe not. I'm just going to keep my distance, you know, just to be safe. And um, uh, uh, once I got that through my fixed goal, it took three consecutive trips of three nights each and three consecutive summers. So it took three years to, to get nine days down. Um, and I went through a series of tests, it turned out to be, that were where they were, the big feet were showing, the big feet, the big foots were showing me about my own fear and in an effort to prepare me for contact. And um, I never did get to see one, but I think I had a face-to-face -face contact with one. Uh, I saw the leaves being kicked up, walking towards me, and I looked up and down. I didn't see anything, and then everything went quiet for a second, then it out popped a uh, robin uh, with an orange breast, you know, those kind of birds. A uh, robin popped out from under the leaves, and, <clears throat> you know, all I could say was, if that was a Bigfoot, it just shapeshifted into a bird. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's likely that that was a Bigfoot because I, I swear to you that, that those feet were kicking up leaves as it walked up this gentle slope. And for about 20 to 30 feet, I, I was looking up and down trying to see it. And I kind of felt like uh, those guys in the first Predator movie, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or Jesse Ventura, where they're looking for this thing and they're looking right at it, but they can't see it. Um, but... Uh, it took three three summers and, and nine days before Kiwani told me on the last morning I was there that they finally said I had a good heart. Mm. So they would do stuff like flick the roof of my tent in the middle of the night or or um, we'd come out from watching a video into the darkness and before I went out to my tent and there'd be a huge explosion sound that would like there's no reason there'd be an explosion in the middle of this forest in the middle of the night. You know, there's no trains or planes out there. Or bombs, you know, there's no explosion. So this is the Sasquatch putting psychic stuff in my head to show me about my fear, to test me in, a, in an effort to show me, rather. Uh, and that's what it took from those experiences was that, man, I was racked with fear. And that it got me to take a look at society and myself and how, as a product of this society, I was normally uh, living my life with certain levels of fear and not really consciously realizing it. For example, fear of being pulled over by the cops. 
uh, fear of not paying your electric bill on time. Or now they're starting to uh, put meters on everybody's water in, in the West Coast with the, with the water shortage, or at least in California, mm-hmm. with the water shortage. And it's like uh, people with wells are being regulated now. And, um, you know, these, these kind of things uh, uh, produce underlying fears in people who need to get up by 9 in the morning and get to work and, and function in their, quote, unquote, normal lives. And, and oftentimes these other stresses don't really fit in with people uh, trying to have norm, quote unquote normal lives. And so, you know, welcome to the world of a contactee. Uh, they're trying to live their, their life. They don't necessarily consciously want to have anything to do with it, yet it's happening. Their families, you know, thinking they're wacko. Their empl- uh, fellow workers, coworkers are thinking they're wacko. And the bottom line is this needs to be resolved. I, I think it's the central issue on our planet today. Money's right behind that because that'll take care of the poverty and all the physical stuff if we if we switch the money back um, and, and make abundance widespread, get free energy out there like the Kessler Foundation's trying to do, like uh, Elon Musk is trying to do with uh, his Tesla technology. Um, and uh, <clears throat> that's how we're going to solve most of these problems. So, you know, who we are is the central issue. And I think some will argue this is a prison planet. I think you can make a good case for that. Others argue it's a school, as you mentioned, Whitley Strieber's book, The Secret School. This could be a school that's purely for spiritual growth and fortification. You know, this it's tough down here, especially if you're a really sensitive person. And going through the trials and tribulations of what modern society has produced uh, makes it very difficult for spiritual advancement. And this is what the big feet were showing me. I was I couldn't believe that it took invisible big feet to show me and again I didn't see the big feet but I have no reason to doubt Kiwani and and then also some of the other experiences I had these things are like yelling at me from the forest and it's like man that's no bear that's no owl that's no deer it's something off the scale and um, it's powerful and so you know hey I didn't see it so I'll stay open to the possibility that this is some kind of a high-tech ruse going on out in the middle of the forest in central Washington but I don't really think it is and I think um, we got a real phenomenon on our hand there's another civilization of humanoids living alongside us known as the big feet and they're interdimensional they're shape-shifting they're psychic um, and um, they just want to live and and I don't think they see that happening unless they and human society can merge in some way for the benefit of both, and that's what I got from my experiences with the Kiwani. It, you know, it seems uh, really interesting that you had a, a, a bunch of subconscious, almost fears of little this and little that. And what we really can, cons- what I, what appears to me is that there's a part of you that uh, contained the fear, and instead of just trying to push away the fear, I think I find it very interesting to say, fearful part of Brett. Uh, what are you afraid of and why are you uh, and what do you really need and to look at each one of the particular fears like the fear of, of uh, uh, the drive of being pulled over or not having enough drinking water or whatever it is uh, and to say what does this part of Brett really need and it's probably to address the fears in some uh, effective way and integrate them so that they are, aren't an unconscious drag on you but that they're conscious and you can deal with them right. well said well said it's uh, uh i'm just ahead. glad it was the bigfoot to teach me this because they didn't charge me anything <laughs> <laughs> it was free <laughs> and i um, learned my lessons well i think that this is a um something to do it's not really a prison planet not really a school it's something to do that we've co-created this um, parameters like like a game, and we're inside here, and we're all the characters in this play, and it gives us something to do, and we have good and evil, light and dark as the uh, continuum, the, the dichotomy upon which to play out all these things that we get to do. We get to be heroes and villains and everything in between. <laughs> that's my that's my uh, belief, I guess you want to call it a belief. Very uh, interesting. Yeah, there's these technological fixes that are coming. For me, disclosure, well, I think once we face our fears and look at them, we'll see that, you know, it wasn't that much to be afraid of. 
um, I work with contact these experiencers. I see that they're they're shifting into a more positive paradigm, and I guess you're working with a lot of people that are still dealing with the dark aspects of it. But yeah. I'm seeing a lot of people that are, you know, I, I've got a lot of whistleblowers and stories, and <clears throat> and people I know are working on board ships and and uh, you know sitting down and having meals with the, some of these extraterrestrials in a real kind of human-like uh, fashion, but they're definitely extraterrestrial. So I think that all needs to come to the forefront uh, so we can make, perhaps um, not be so fearful because of the it's uh, the unknown. Uh, so, and, I, and I would just like to say about Sasquatch, I did a series of interviews with Lloyd Pye who uh, compared right. every every uh, bone in uh, Homo erectus' uh, uh, his body uh, with that of a Homo sapiens. A Homo erectus, uh, Lloyd says, is the ancestor of Sasquatch, and although we're basically Anunnaki whose genome has been adapted to Earth, the adaptation was made possible by use of uh, genes from Homo erectus, and that's our, that's how, there's a part of us that is Sasquatch, that can feel that part of us, and that's what Kiwani is able to do, and he's, and what he's was teaching you, that's what it sounds like to me. Yeah, uh, yeah, and just the idea that I I needed more spiritual growth that was enlightening in and of itself. I thought I'd come a long way, but really I hadn't, and that was a bit of an awakening for me as well. That I still had lots of work to do. So now, I'm not ever going to say I'm there. Mm -hmm. I'm just always going to say I've got work to do, and and I'm just going to keep working. You know, on the journey. Yeah, I think as soon as you think you you think you're there, you're not really there. Right. Enlightenment right. isn't what you think. <laughs> right. 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 I'll tell you. Well, let me leave you a little teaser before we go to our break. Oh, good. Um, Thanks. So I'm not sure why the I just I feel like I'm being shown this this darkness. Um, my gut tells me that that's because it's preparing me for something in the future. The the spirits, the good side, the the universe, God, whatever you want to call it, uh, is preparing me by giving me these experiences. And so <clears throat> one night sitting in this law study group here in Chico, California, where I study with a bunch of, uh, um, you know, I call them the white elders, you know. We don't really have a tribe anymore, right, because uh, we're separated from our Druid and Nordic past, our roots. So so um, I'm with this group of old guys that are trying to teach me about the law. And um, one of the old guys tells me, uh, you know, I had recently, just before I go to the meeting, I'm, saying a prayer, you know, hey, I'm trying to help one of my friends here, and nothing I, I feed to her seems to be working. You know, if, if this uh, shouting out the name of Jesus isn't going to work, then give me some kind of sign that something's going to work. So later that night at the meeting, one of the old guys leans over and goes, you know, um, I know you're, you're discussing this whole demons thing with your UFO work. He goes, you should go down to this church in Yuba City and deal with these guys, Cher, uh, Dave and Cheryl Bryan, and Jess Parker, and there, there's this certain legend that my friend didn't quite get through to me too much, but it had to do with Anton LaVey and some kind of a magical battle that took place between these church leaders and Anton LaVey. So uh -huh. while I definitely will stay open to the idea that these dark things are thought forms, um, I'm also open to the idea that it's a separate set of beings that like say demons are a separate race or the jinn are a separate race i need to stay open to that too as a researcher if i'm honest with myself because just speaking for myself only i don't really know so i'm i'm busy doing my work trying to find interview people read books uh have experiences try to cross-reference everything to try to find some kind of a definitive answer there may not be one but what i did was i went down and experienced a deliverance ceremony by a man named Jess Parker. And Jess Parker has a book called To Hell with Sarah, and it's one of the best mind control books I've ever read. And the really interesting part about it is some of the stuff that was in that book, I had only learned from a couple places. One was my former Druid priestess teacher. Another was the Stuart Swordlow books, Oh, yeah. and, and doing my interviews with Stuart Swordlow. And another was one of the cases that I'm working on. Okay, very narrow uh, pool from which to find this kind of information. 
But it, well, here it was in a fundamentally Christian exorcism book. And so I had to go down and interview Jess Parker. And, and during my interview, I asked him, um, you know, where did you get this information? You've done impeccable research. He didn't know about any of the people that I talked about. He'd never heard of Stuart Swerdlow. He doesn't know about the Montauk Project. And I go, well, where did you get this information? He said, from the demon. Mm. And so for me as a journalist, I got goosebumps just telling you that. Because that's a confirmation for me, for the research that I've done, that there are such a thing as demons or whatever you want to call them. There's something there that whether it's a thought form or an actual separate race of beings, whether it's the actual manifestation of the fundamentalist biblical good and evil scenario, man, all of a sudden all this stuff is looking like not so crazy after all. And with that, we'll be back in three minutes. Join Tammy as she uncovers hidden secrets about the spiritual world of angels, ghosts, and other entities that have been with us longer than we know. Tammy is a psychic, a teacher, spiritual coach, a leader in her field, and will be sharing her information and stories with you. So join us on Tuesdays at noon on Studio A. With Tammy's guidance, you'll find out who has been watching over you from the other side, and soon you will be talking with your angels. The opinions expressed on this radio station, its programs, and its website by the hosts, guests, and call-in listeners or chatters are solely the opinions of the original source who expressed them. They do not necessarily represent the opinions of Revolution Radio and FreedomSlips.com, its staff, or affiliates. You're listening to Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com, 100% listener-supported radio, and now we return you to your host. <laughs> Aloha, everyone, and welcome back to the Sacred Matrix on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I'm Jana Carol Lesson, your host, with my co-host, Dr. Sasha Lesson, and we are interviewing Brett Luter. We're having a fascinating conversation with Brett. Before we get back to our show, I want to remind everybody that Revolution Radio is listener-supported, so please do go over to that button on freedomslips.com and donate what you can. A dollar, five, fifteen, twenty, whatever you can donate is greatly appreciated. And we do appreciate you for your donation because it allows us to bring you these shows like ours and the other many dozens of hosts on Studio A and Studio B on freedomslips.com. And before we go back, I just wanted to say something. Um, I want to relay a brief thing about a, a, what I perceive as a demonic entity named George. But, <laughs> Sasha, what would you like to say before we get back oh, to the just, show? Just the, the, this, uh, I think, is um, we're hung up on a, a spurious false dichotomy between what's inside and outside. The Talbot hypothesis that uh, each of us reflects everything in the universe uh, in ourselves uh, to different degrees and from different angles, and that we are in, uh, an aspect of us is in every other part of the universe actually accounts uh, very neatly for all the, the data. I do a lot of past life regression and I find that this is uh, instead of getting hung up on the reality status of stuff just to realize that the, the, 
you are if the, if you're seeing demons, there's a, either a part of you that's receptive to uh, interaction with the demon, or a part of you that you have uh, denied natural expression of. And any part of you which is denied natural expression builds up its energy till it becomes demonic. So that, for example, normal expression of annoyance never expressed. Uh, makes a person uh, have a, a sub-personality that's dominant, uh, which is always sweet, and then he goes and shoots everybody in McDonald's uh, when it goes demonic. So that the, de the demon is potentially any part of us that isn't fully integrated and allowed uh, to uh, be managed by a center that takes all of us in our ecology into consideration, in my opinion. <laughs> right. So I, my question... Uh, is was this demon that uh, Jess Parker was that an external being that he got to interview to get all this uh, information that was similar to Stuart Swerdlow's and the others? Did he did he say it was some kind of ex external being? And my other question is: Can these external beings be manifestation that come physically, like what happened to Duncan Cannon? Cameron in the Phil, or not the, uh, the um, Montauk chair, that that was actually something that he produced from his mind, and he manifested it in 3D reality. What are your thoughts on that, Brett? Um, well, I can tell you uh, that th it's not like uh, these beings came outside of the person and were standing next to the person they were possessing. They were coming through the people, whatever they are, demon or not. Mm -hmm. Jess Parker just sees this through the lens of an exorcism or a demonological perspective. And through that perspective and through that tradition, he's been able to have success. Um, he claims to... There, there are three main weapons, and I'm really fascinated by this. I don't disagree with anything that Dr. Saucer just said, because that could be possible too. Um, but yet, these girls that I'm dealing with, they need some kind of a remedy for this just telling them that it's a part of them that hasn't been uh, uh, incorporated properly or that has been denied, that doesn't seem to help. What we want to do is get this stuff to stop happening so they could take a look at stuff like that about themselves and try to make a change of some kind. Because I do agree uh, with Dr. Sasha that some kind of connection has been made through the will. This is where we get into magic. This is where we get into contracts. Have we made a contract to go through this stuff? Um, if you've seen the movie uh, The Exorcism of Emily Rose, uh, it's a dramatic court case uh, where this priest is getting sued for the death of this girl. It's a fascinating story. But in the end, there was some kind of a supernatural letter that multiple witnesses found saying that she chose to do this in service of God, to die, to sacrifice to the demon to let the public know what was going on. So, you know, whether that's actually what the case was or not I don't know um, again I wasn't there but I'm, I'm cross-referencing all this stuff and so so I just want to be able to help my friends let's just put it that simply so I'm not married to whatever the solution is I just want to help them these girls are being tortured you know and and if this is good that's happening to them I got to question who the good guys are because I don't think we especially with their level of it of technology that they need to be hurting people you know, it's a huge red flag. So they're secretive, they willfully hurt, and a high, in my opinion, at least high beings are not are going to take care to not hurt a lower being. So if you have a pet, you want to make sure you take care of that pet, right? You you don't, you know, it's not even your subject of experiment. It's just a just a pet, but you want to love it and take care of it because you want good for that and and you want to work together with it. I don't see them. I don't see anything that tries to hurt humanity with the high level of technology that they have and still try to be secretive. I just, that's huge red flags for me. So, so whether they are demons or jinn or gray aliens or uh, uh, some kind of dark spirits that are inhabiting these um, suits, like in the Sherry Wild scenario, the, the tall gray named Da told Sherry that the, that the, what they, we call a gray alien or a Zeta suit, uh, a, alien is really a space suit that, and that the dark wraparound goggles are really just lenses that hide the brilliance of their spirit. It's too bright for us, is what this being Da told Sherry Wilde. 
So I got to tell you, if you're doing a PR campaign to try to win over a species or help a species, you don't choose a spacesuit that scares the bejesus out of them. So I find that a questionable thing too. So what we're dealing with here, I'm not sure. But these beings are not external beings in the sense that that we can touch them, at least from what I have read. These beings need bodies to inhabit our world. That's why they come through people. Um, the I, I just got through reading also to The Jinn Connection by Rosemary Ellen Galley. It's an excellent work, product of 40 years of cross-referencing all of her cases, having to do with weird, wild, paranormal stuff. And she says, well, these are all the jinn, because the jinn have these super long lifespans. They God kicked them off of Earth to make a room for humans, and so they've been pissed at humans ever since. Um, you know, and then again, as Dr. Sasha mentioned in the first segment, uh, the Middle East has their own traditions that where, where they have their own way of dealing with jinns, you know, putting them in, in uh, bottles and being you know, able to control them that way or putting them in jewels or there's markets. You can go to the marketplace in Middle Eastern countries, according to Rosemary Ellen Guiley, and you can, instead of going to buy jewelry at one booth or clothes at another booth, you can go talk to a, um, I forget the term, but he's like a shaman in their culture. And you could purchase certain objects that have certain demons in them that are good for certain tasks, specific tasks. And that's just part of their culture. Right. So, 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 again, I don't disagree with anything that you said describing it the way you did, Dr. Sasha, because I think that's one, that's one of the things that makes this such a tricky subject is because it can be described with a number of different vantage points that from an external perspective seem to conflict. And... And um, so, look, to try to get to the bottom of this, I'll explain the rest of the story going down to Yuba City. So I went down on the suggestion of some of my older friends, 70-plus-year-old friends going, yeah, I got to go down and see this guy, whatever. He had a deliverance ceremony, and, and basically it was like I was in a TV show or a movie where I was there with the intention of being a journalist to observe what was going on. I wasn't going to judge anything. I wasn't going to talk any smack. I wasn't going to scoff. That's very unprofessional, especially. And, and as a UFO investigator as well, you never want to scoff at somebody who has a wild story to tell you, you know, or they're not, not going to tell you, right? So I'm sitting in this church, and <clears throat> Jess, Jess is leading it, and he says, okay, you know, we're going we're gonna to do the ceremony now. I want everyone to take a deep breath, you know, get your heads clear, and um, we're going to start. Today we're going to work on the demon of rejection. And um, he goes, okay, all right, demon, just we want you to get the heck out of here now. And he starts raising his voice and starts going on these little rants, almost like an auctioneer. Um, starts using the name of Christ. The three main tools I learned when I went down to interview Jess Parker was the word of uh, was the name of Christ, the blood of Christ, and then the word of God. And then what they do at the end to kind of talk about what you did earlier, Doctor Sasha, was they call in the the angels or the host of angels to bind the demon and drag it off. And so when they when they say it's over is when they see the angels, and they claim to actually see the angels do that. So when I'm there, I'm, I'm sitting in this thing. There's about 100 people in uh, like five different columns of, of, of seats. And um, after about 10 or 15 minutes, you could feel energy building. It was getting a little warmer in the room. I felt like I was in a stadium where uh, the crowd gets excited over their team just scored, and you can feel that group energy. You know, it's it'll make your hair stand on end. Well, I started to feel that a little bit, and so I thought, wow, okay, well, everyone's focusing. You could definitely feel that. And then the first lady dropped forward and started writhing on the ground, moaning. And I'm going, I'm, look, I'm laughing to myself, going, no friggin' way. And, I, and people, these aides, they're all lined up alongside of the thing, and they're... Six of them, like, rushed to go pray over her and put their hands on her and to try to comfort her, whatever they were doing. And I'm going, like, this is incredible. I've never seen this maybe on the X-Files or some movie or something. And um, there goes another one on the other side of the room. Oh! You know, and they get all shook up, and then people come over, and they start putting their hands on, laying hands on, and start praying over them. Well, by the time this was done, let's say, there was probably six or seven people that were being attended to. I myself, about halfway through seeing this, thought, well, you know what, I'm going to I'm gonna just join in, and I'm going to close my eyes and start breathing deeply, uh, do a little exercise my teacher taught me, and you breathe in the light and out with the dark, very simple. And so I started doing that. 
Next thing you know, Cheryl Bryan, the matriarch of the church, uh, she and her husband Dave Bryan wrote their own book called The Serpent and the Savior, and it was more the direct magical battle with Anton LaVey. Next thing I know, I open my eyes, and she, Cheryl Bryan, is one row ahead of me with her hands on a lady in front of me. And you could hear them. They were like, I don't know if they were speaking in tongues, or, or I couldn't hear exactly what prayers they were saying or what sites of the citations of the Bible they were saying, whatever. I couldn't quite hear, but I thought, shoot, I better keep my eyes closed so they don't make eye contact with me and come over to me, right? Because I'm just there as an observer. So I got kept my eyes closed, and I'm breathing along really good, in with the light, out with the dark, in with the light, out with the dark. Next thing you know, she's got her hands on me. She's saying whatever she was saying. My One of my elder friends was leaning from the uh, row of, of uh, the bench behind me, put his hands on me, and he was saying prayers over me. I'm telling you guys, by the end of that, say, five minutes of them doing that, I had completely sweated out my long sleeve T-shirt. And I was dumbfounded. Well, why would that happen? Well, I don't necessarily know if I know, but their tradition says something came out of me. So here I am as a journalist, and I go down there just to, on a suggestion of a friend, to go go get educated about this and see what they're doing, all in an effort to try to help my friends that are going through these abduction scenarios. All of a sudden, I'm, something's happening to me, and now I'm sweating out my shirt. I, I'd done that only in certain sessions working with my Druid priestess teacher uh, 10 years or so ago. And um, so I knew something was going, some kind of energy was coming out of me or going through me. And um, as a journalist now, i got to tell you, that was very compelling to go down there and have that happen to me. Whatever it is, thought form, another race of beings, I don't know, but whatever it was, according to their tradition, something came out of me. Okay, so I'm fascinated by this now. So, okay. So I, yeah, so I, got, I had to go interview Jess Parker. We had a fascinating interview. Um, it, was, it was weird because I just interviewed... Omnek Onek, the lady from Venus up in Mount Shasta. Oh, yeah. Right, and we had a, and she and I had a conversation in part about how Venus was really heaven. Okay, so to my surprise, in my interview with Jess Parker down in Yuba City, he said his wife was deceased. He thinks it was a demon that did it. That the family had a a history of of early deaths because of a certain demon that he had since gotten rid of, but it took his wife first. Uh, he said that his wife was on another planet. So that really kind of shook me a little bit that a fundamental Christian guy would say that. Um, so these th these church people aren't regular church people because I'm telling you, I was raised as a, as a Roman Catholic, and so I know about some of the treachery of the Roman church, some of the strictness of it. Uh, you know, I grew up to learn about pedophilia and all this stuff and not trust religion at all. So it's... It's very compelling why I'm even back down here to begin with. But it all revolves around researching the power of the name of Jesus Christ, okay? So so do you, do you want me to keep going? Because I could. Well, Sasha's comments and then I have comments. Well, uh, just, sure. uh, I uh, used to attend with my second wife, uh, Shivite uh, things with uh, Muktananda and Guru Mai. And, uh, you, you know, you, you spend hours sitting cross-legged saying, oh, Om Namah Shivaya, everything is, is, is divine. And people go into what's called Kriyas, which exactly describe what uh, you uh, w went through in a, a, a neo-Christian uh, church. And it's the same thing that we uh, experienced in holotropic breath work, where, we have, where people breathe deep and fast to powerful, evocative uh, music. Uh, with uh, uh, as someone who's watching over them, allowing them and encouraging them to go deeper. And with any kind of trauma, what I find is, especially going back to those, the women that you feel so traumatized, if you try not to feel the trauma, what you resist will persist. And so what we do in psychotherapy is we say, it hurt, but you didn't want to feel it. Feel it now. Feel it to the max. Feel it even more intensely than when it happened. And instead of avoiding it, we go in more deeply. And let's go back into your past lives when you experience something similar or that may have a relevance to this. So that rather than avoid the trauma, uh, we go into it uh, more heavily and it dissipates. Right. If you if you should people, it just makes it more demonic and more likely to. Uh, grow in their in their psyche. So, 
we work with it, and, and this is once again a competent therapist that can really do therapy, really facilitate their process, and allow them to go into it deeper. Then they're going to get the message, and they'll they'll find out it's themselves. If it's something that happened in their lives, their current lives in the womb before they came here in previous lifetimes, there's usually a resonance. If you're going to have a demonic possession, there's an internal resonance with the external force. And at some level, you're allowing it to take possession of you if, that's, if you're going to symbol it that way. There's all ways of symboling it. I was a ch young child. I was forced to go to see her, uh, Catherine Coleman, who was an evangelist in the in the Pittsburgh, Ohio area, and they were doing that back then. And I just I just watched all that stuff, and I was just totally appalled as a 12 year old. And I said, "Can't anybody see it from my perspective?" I I just saw oh, a lot of people, and I'm not saying this would happen with your people, but a lot of people that they like that attention they get. And they go up, and they, it was like a ritual for them. And I realized, oh, it was fun for them. They get to go, they get some attention, they get people, and they they like talking. And they, it's called hysteria. They get hysterical. They get into this glossaria. Uh, glossaria, and they just go, Wah! and it's really high and spiritual. And they feel great, and they go back, and they can go do their jobs of, you know, in the office or you know, cleaning toilets. So, oh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Right. I, and, and so I would. I just uh, one last thing. Oh, uh, let's see. Um, oh, Catherine Coleman. I made some notes. So when we're looking at the whole phenomenon, and I am a reporter investigator as well, I, I say, okay, is this an external force? Force an internal force? Are they manifesting it inside, outside? Are they calling it into their being? Is there a message? Is there a lesson? Uh, what are they getting out of it? A lot of people who act out and and invite these things, they they want attention. They 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 need someone to focus on them and perhaps go into you know when uh, Uncle Joe uh, kissed my yoni when I was baby in the crib. So there's usually some kind of incident, and that's why I really recommend to your friends to start with themselves and get a competent therapist, which will focus on them and and they go into like hypnosis or regression and uncover their own stuff. And then magically, it may stop happening. Yeah, one of the most interesting things that we found with Stan Groff is that we have unconscious memories of these stages of uh, gestation, and that uh, these things, uh, because we don't have words to symbol them, they later be become symboled in more complex ways, but they, they are often just uh, resonances of our uh, gestation and birth. All right, back to Very you. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, um, it's a fascinating subject, you know. Um, uh, you know, once someone's back from an abduction, you can talk to them about those kind of things, but how do you stop it from happening? I mean, these supposedly... I say break it up. Yeah. Invite them yeah. in and find out what the message is, because okay. you can't stop it on the human level. Uh, so there, there's something going, or perhaps put up cameras, have people in the house... See if you can catch the thing in the act. No, it's more than cameras. It's a, uh, a, a, a summon. Uh, I would like you to open yourself and summons uh, your contactee uh, ex that you're calling uh, extraterrestrial now and let that being use your vocal apparatus but not take you over so we can have a conversation. And you'll be amazed how often they respond and you start getting a conversation with a totally different voice that has a lot of things to say. So, uh, again, not disagreeing one bit because um, <laughs> talking with Jess Parker, that's exactly what would happen, except according to their experience, without fail and with using the three tools that I described earlier, the name of Jesus, the word of God, and the blood of Jesus, that they would get all the different characters, the spirit guides, the ancestors, the spirit helpers, whatever, the angels, they all would finally confess that they were a demon and they'd ask for mercy. So, again, I, I haven't been there while they do this. I'm just learning about this. Um, I, apparently, since I've been through his seminar, I'm qualified to do this myself. So, but I don't want to, you know, I've had some experiences myself where I've gotten the, the short end of the stick dealing with something like this. So if that's my own mind, I'll just say, well, I must have a powerful mind. <laughs> <laughs> I just, now I just need to get a hold of it, you know. 
Um, but whatever the case is, uh, let me just finish this story real quick. Uh, down at the church are the leaders of the church, Dave and Cheryl Bryan. And they had a, a lady show up on their doorstep. I think it was back in 2005. They didn't, she didn't say who she really was, but she was badly beaten. She told some of the horror stories about beaten with two by fours and gang raped and uh, this kind of thing. And she was running from those people. Well, they would later find out uh, that it was Anton LaVey's daughter. He has two daughters, and this was one of his daughters escaped uh, her lifestyle, is what she told these church people. And that lifestyle was that she was being groomed as a bride of Satan, they called it. And that is one of seven girls that each girl goes through seven defilement rituals. And I'm, I'll just let your imaginations wander what each ritual might entail. Um, and that at the end of once all the girls are defiled in their own rituals on Halloween, one of the seven gets picked to bring in the Antichrist. That's the supposedly was Anton LaVey's ultimate goal. You know, Anton LaVey being the founder of the Church of Satan. And so <clears throat> this battle begins to go on as these church people try to protect this lady. And as Halloween approaches, um, I, I keep getting the dates mixed up, so don't quote me on the dates. I think it's 2005, but it might have been earlier. Um, as Halloween approached of that year, they thought that they had gotten rid of all the stuff that had kept coming through the girl, whether they were demons or they would claim that Anton LaVey would actually come through the girl and start naming people and calling them out and cursing them. They thought they had that all gone. It was Halloween night, and Anton LaVey breaks through the girl. She's asleep in her room, so she comes running out to this house, running out into the street, screaming she's been kidnapped. The cops get involved, and according to these people, uh, the girl was put in the back of the cop car um, to be taken to a safe place. The church people didn't get arrested. They said they talked their way out of that. But while the girl was in the backseat of the car, they said it was Anton LaVey coming through, calling everybody out on the sidewalk and cursing them, saying stuff like, she's mine. She's mine by contract. I could do with what I want with her. So... The, at this point now, the church people are lucky they didn't go to jail, so they're reeling. The girl they've been trying to protect for months is now back in the hands of Anton LaVey. He supposedly had a compound in Grass Valley, California, which was about an hour, hour and 15 minutes away from Yuba City. And they were headed there to do this defilement ritual before midnight, as, as, as the story goes. Well, Dave and Cheryl Bryan start calling their people. They start searching around Yuba City, determine, uh, and what I call a brilliant stroke of genius because these are fundamental Christians remember there's only one passage that they found in the Bible that talks about a silver cord which a lot of the new agey people that were more familiar with that people that are familiar with astral projection that kind of thing or seen uh, out on a limb by Shirley MacLaine back in the uh, late 70s um, these people figured out Anton LaVey's out of his body because he's in the girl so they a group of 13 of them drive up to the compound out in front of the driveway. I guess there's a big, long driveway. And they start praying uh, that if Anton LaVey is not going to repent, that they want his cord cut. And so they prayed for about a half hour. Uh, the girls come screaming, running down the driveway. They scoop her up. They don't ask any questions, right? They just scoop her up, drive her back to Yuba City, prayed all night in the church. And according to these people, um, Anton LaVey's other daughter showed up as an apparition crying, saying, why did you guys kill my father? Why did you guys kill my father? And, the, and, and Dave and Cheryl Bryan and Jess Parker and the rest of the people, they said they didn't know that they killed anybody. All they knew was that Ant, uh, Anton LaVey's daughter comes running down the driveway, and she's herself again. It's hysterical, but she's herself again. They scoop her up and take her back to the, to the church. Well, to top it off, <clears throat> they say... That, uh, you know, if you've ever seen pictures of Anton LaVey, he's often pictured with a big boa constrictor wrapped around his neck. Well, that supposedly housed the spirit known as Leviathan. And these church people said that that thing appeared as an apparition and cursed them out like they'd never heard before because Anton LaVey was their guy on earth that was preparing the way for the Antichrist. And, you know, as a journalist... I don't know how the heck I'm going to corroborate a half of this stuff, let alone, you know, all of it. You know what I mean? So I'm fascinated by this. It's chronicled in a book called The Serpent and the Savior. Uh, it's hard to find, along with if you go Google 
To Hell with Sarah, Jess Parker's book, you can only get a copy for like, I don't know, 70 or 80 bucks because they're so hard to come by. Um, <clears throat> but that's what I'm doing. I'm going to try to corroborate some of what they're saying. Now, I've got a, I've got a contact in for Anton LaVey's other daughter, and I haven't heard back yet, but I hopefully will be able to talk to her soon because the Church of Satan people have a totally different take on it. They say Anton LaVey did not die on Hall uh, Halloween night, the 31st, but that he actually died from another reason on the 1st of November. So the, so the Church of Satan themselves even isn't saying that he, that he died in some way other time. They're just trying to make the case that it was the morning of the next day when, you know, after I've studied the magical traditions that I've studied, my gut feeling also tells me that it's more likely that he died that night because that's the night that that's before the ritual had to happen and they could never complete the ritual. So, so this is what I'm going on as a journalist. My jaw hit the floor when I heard about this stuff. So I'm exploring this right now. I hope I tell you straight, both of you, I hope and pray that I find out these are just thought forms and that we can through psychological integration techniques, Everyone could be cured. I hope, because that would be a lot easier job than than I think what the other scenario is. And you know, for that scenario, you could look at any number of a one of famous exorcism movies. And if we really are in a battle for good and evil, which is what I really think the UFO thing is, I, we're going to have to address these fundamentalist scenarios that I think a lot of us intellectuals, and including myself in this, or more new agey type people, people that don't trust religion. We need to kind of check ourselves for making fun of these people if this stuff turns out to be right. So um, comments, please, <laughs> before I ramble too far. We're not saying that these people are dangerous and aren't master hypnotists either. Right. Uh, I'm, I'm looking at Anton LaVey. He's they a are. Character. I, I, I Googled him. <laughs> there you go. I'll have to research him later. Um, yeah, I... It's fascinating and compelling to me as a journalist. So I'm trying to f see if I can find any kind of corroborable evidence to support their story. And, and again, this all falls back to the power of the name of Jesus. They're doing this stuff claiming with the name. So it's compelling well, to look at. One time uh, Sasha was doing therapy with a client, and I had stepped out of the room to go to the bathroom. And when I came back, um, he was saying, Sasha said, well, who do we have here? And and, uh, you know, it was somebody that was uh, possessed by something. And, they, and his shape, his face kind of looked really weird. And, and I, I just went and sat beside him. And he says, in a very strange voice, I am Satan. <laughs> and, and Sasha just proceeded to do therapy with Satan. And he asked Satan to go into the light and, you know, the whole Bill Baldwin thing. And the, and the, the satanic guy called himself Satan and had taken over a client went on back to the other side and let go of him, and then our, our client returned to normal. So it was like, whoa, I was just in awe that, you know, it was kind of scary because I had seen The Exorcist, but Sasha just took it in stride and <laughs> did therapy right. with the guy. So I would say, compose. yeah, you can do all, it depends on what you believe. Some people need the, the theatrics for the exorcism, and that's why we have all these movies and we have these movements, and some people are more, you know, just need someone to talk them through it. Um, sure. I, I like, you know, trying to do the traditional therapy and removing it because it's a little bit less um, dramatic and intense. I, I think that watching that ritual they did would probably be very intense. But it doesn't matter. However the person symbols it, you can make make it happen and they can, they can go away, be it extraterrestrial. Now, if it truly is military forces or the Illuminati, which are 3D, that's the one you need to fear most rather than interdimensionalists because those aren't going to go away with a ritual and an exorcism. People have been doing exorcisms for thousands of years. You know, Jesus did exorcism. But real military and real Illuminati that are coming in physically taking you, now that's a little bit harder to do. Yeah, and and real, real cults that, that murder children and, um, and Myrtle and the things that are going on at, uh, at uh, the Grove where they Bohemian. sacked Bohemian Grove. We're talking about uh, murder and kidnapping and, uh, you know, you talk about uh, many religions.
religious leaders. Think of Jim Jones and the, and the people that he brought down to Guyana and talked into killing themselves. We're dealing with real dangerous people as well, and a lot of these people are masquerading as though they're decent people. You know, people like Dick Cheney, or, uh, um, who's pretending to be a, a public servant. So uh, my question <laughs> to you, with your friends, if you could interview them a little bit more, are do they have any physical uh, markings on their bodies? Sometimes, yeah. And yeah. as, what kind are they? Are they stigmata? Or, are claw they, marks. On one in particular, claw marks, yeah. Claw Slashes, marks. yeah. Well, try moving. <laughs> Yeah, that's been suggested. Yeah, yeah one, one in particular has been there for almost 20 years now, right. and um, in close proximity to a, a military base, and um, you know that's an obvious one for sure. Look, this this particular person and I, uh, we've become pretty good friends, of course, because this kind of research and investigation can get very intimate really quickly, um, and I don't mean sex, but I mean you're dealing with very personal issues from these people when they're going through this kind of stuff. Um, uh, we were having trouble with our communication. Our, our uh, my telephone would get messed with. My email, email, she wouldn't get them. Um, and so I finally just told her one time, "Hey, I don't know when it's going to be, but I'm just going to show up one time and we'll hang out, and then we won't tell them what happened." So this one time uh, a few years ago, I showed up on her doorstep, scooped her up. We drove um, from the North Bay down to the South Bay to hang out with some of my friends. And we went to this park that I grew up kind of playing in, in the, in the South San Jose foothills. And um, it was just right at dusk, so the gate had closed. So I had to turn around in front of the gate. We couldn't go into the parking lot. And I look up, and there's a craft, low craft, coming over us. You know, a few thousand feet is what I'd guess. It was a bright light, but it was uh, enough. there was enough daylight out still, even though the sun had gone down, where I could see that there was a structure within the light. I couldn't tell exactly what kind of structure it was. But as I'm noticing this, there's a second one much higher up traveling at a skew angle to it. So I was watching both of them go in two different directions at the same time, looking up. I hadn't even gotten out of my truck yet. Okay, so something or someone is watching this person, and they were caught. They had been monitoring our communications, and they'd been caught off guard when I showed up without warning. To top off that night, because we're really what we started out doing was to skywatch, and we got our eyeful for sure. We ended up the night going down to a local reservoir and looking because that was away from the city lights. And out of nowhere, we could see this road, and it's night out, so any lights we could see for, you know, a mile before we get to us. And all of a sudden, there's a white tr pickup truck. It could have been a Chevy, could have been a Ford, a Dodge. I'm not sure. And it came from behind us, drove into the, the gravel pop-out that we were parked on next to the road, and drove up really slow next to my truck and then took off. We didn't really get a good look at the face, but, um, you know, if you've done your conspiracy research, which I know you guys have, you know that the, the white vehicles are like the UN vehicles that they're starting to um, make more and more prevalent here in the United States and elsewhere. Yep. Uh, so um, also in the foothills right by where we were is a... Is it's not a secret IBM plant, but it's it's a IBM plant that does some pretty secretive things. Um, it's it's one of the plants that Marcel Vogel worked out of or worked with before Marcel Vogel passed away. Um, if you remember Marcel Vogel, he was uh, he worked with Wendell Stevens during the Billy Meyer case. Yeah. Uh, Wendell Stevens had given him a, a piece of uh, interesting markings or hieroglyphs on it, and um, it wound up getting lost in the mail. That was that Marcel Vogel. He's also pioneered a lot of crystal technology. Um, so weird stuff dealing with this one particular woman. But the fact that these beings, or, or maybe it's military, got caught off guard, that was like a small little feather in my cap or our cap. We caught them off guard. That means just like in Arnold Schwarzenegger and the Predator, if it bleeds, we can kill it. You know, if, if they can be fooled, if they can be caught off guard, then we do stand a chance. That's how I took that. Mm -hmm. So it's it's been tricky, and you guys both give some really good suggestions that I will pass along. And um, you never know; she may agree to talk with one or both of you at some point in the future. So, so um, I'll keep you posted. I know we're going to stay in touch after this uh, conversation, 
Of uh, course. You guys are new friends of mine. I appreciate that very much. Had a wonderful time with you guys in Sacramento a few weeks ago. And, um, of course, I'm going to be reading your books here soon. So, You know, uh, Brett, one really interesting thing to do in a, as a way of expanding the experience, let's say uh, she says, uh, I was put upon a, 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 a table uh, and, and blah, blah, blah. And the table's background, what you can say is, if you could identify with the table, pretend you are it, and state your existence in the situation, uh, this dissociation from the uh, identified self and identification with something which appears to be outside opens reams of data and all kinds, and it just opens things up. So focus on sometimes the background material and have the person identify with them and uh, establish a, a dialogue with that background object. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's hard to translate, but the, the, there's things in her environment that if she starts looking at them, and uh, what we're asking you to do is gestalt these different items, and she'll get more information. So it, these, these could be like screen memories or, or things that she's in her mind overlaid to uh, layer the information. So, or, or it could be mind control. Anyway, there's a layering of information, and there are ways of, of unfolding the information and getting the details. And in the details, she'll set herself free once she realizes what's really going on. And with, with beings, you can say, well, imagine that this uh, uh, being that uh, that uh, took you uh, is wearing a, a, a mask and a suit, and it's got a zipper. Now, unzip that with your mind and see what is underneath that. And you, you can do a number of ex explorations like that, and it leads you to uh, data. Remember what Janet said about resonances. Everything that happens has a here and now thing. So you're with this woman in the car doing this and that. So whatever comes up will have something to do with that. She'll also, it'll also have to do with her current life. It'll also have some resonances about what happened when she was a kid. It'll also have some past life and some in the womb resonances if you go deep enough. And so uh, just keep probing instead of backing away and trying not to feel stuff. Feel it ever more deeply is my suggestion. Okay. I, I will try all of what you've suggested. Um, right now, what I have lined up for this one, we're talking about one particular lady in, in a case. Um, she's agreed to go through the deliverance ceremony next time Jess Parker has one. Mm -hmm. And I also recently just brought over a friend of ours, uh, Lori McDonald, to meet her. So um, Lori's got a really busy schedule. Um, but uh, hopefully we're going to get uh, my friend uh, with Lori here in the next month or so, and we're going to just start going through all the different uh, avenues to try to uh, provide her a remedy to her situation. And yours are on the list, and they will get tried unless something cool. works first, you know? Cool. Okay. Yeah. So I appreciate yeah. your input Fix. very much. Fix. You just keep going until something works, but, you know, Maybe moving is the only thing to work. <laughs> but well, no. sometimes you move and it follows you, so that doesn't work. My, yeah. my paranormal experience has followed me, so I just kept going. Personally, I just kept going in the therapeutic route until eventually uh, I realized that the common denominator in everything was me. And so it was happening to me and not somebody well, else. I had also, to going inward and find out what was pulling that experience to me and not to you know someone else, my sister or something. What I see common between what you just described and maybe what I'm describing about Jess Parker and their tradition is perseverance. And so if you can hold your intention long enough to get rid of anything, eventually it's going to go. Because you're, you just you take hold of your own power mm -hmm. and, and, and outlast it. And um, you see this with exorcisms too. So maybe it doesn't matter because words really are just symbols, right? Mm -hmm. And they're, back, they're charged with intentions. And so it may not matter what word it is, like you described earlier in the first segment, Janet, mm -hmm. whether it's Jesus or whether it's Gorgonzola or whatever, if your intention is that you want to repel something, that uh, you can use any symbol you want. So you just got to hold that intention long enough. And you see this with the exorcisms where some of them will go within like a half hour or something, and you'll hear a couple different voices, and they'll admit what they are or whatever, and then they'll go... But others last weeks or months or years, they'll work on certain people before they claim to have seen the angels take them off. So um, 
that really, you know, that's why in my own work, I philosophically have deduced all the traditions down to three tools. I call these the tools of, uh, of binding, the tools of, uh, of manifestation. They are ritual, symbolism, and intention. And those three rules are cross-cultural, uh, non-denominational, and they're intrinsic to being humans as breathing is. And so what we find in cultures around the world are just stylized versions of rituals, symbols, and intentions. So so whether it's um, uh, the tradition Dr. Sasha and, and you, Janet, have outlined a uh, more psychological approach, or whether it's a tr- fundamental traditional approach using the name of Christ, or whether you're... Uh, from the Middle East, and you're using whatever uh, chants from the Quran, maybe not using the name of Christ, although that's part of their tradition too, maybe using the name of Muhammad or something else, the name of Allah, maybe that works for you. Whatever it is, you could be 100% right that it's just the intention that matters. And it's like a it's like a war of attrition now. So whether it's an external being that's inhabiting your body that's another race from another dimension, or whether it's an aspect of yourself or higher self, whether you're fighting yourself or something else, the fight's still the same. Right. Hold your intention to where you want to go and keep keep the train on the tracks. Keep the boat in the safe water. Keep down that middle path, so to speak, and pedal to the metal, and you will eventually win. I love your analysis, I, and I quite concur with it. In psychology, we have something called the fish hypothesis. Uh, fish noticed that you could be Jungian or Rogerian or uh, Gestaltist, and it didn't matter, rational emotive. Uh, you, you would go to somebody who uh, was paying attention to you, taught you a set of symbols or worked with a set of symbols that worked for you, and uh, as your life changed, and one of the elements that was changing is the intention of this person who gives you unconditional uh, acceptance, uh, paraphrases what you say every now and then, and, get, and, and gives you feedback. And, and so it doesn't matter what the symbols are as much as the intention uh, of these people like you and this uh, person that you, you have created yourself as a caring friend uh, who's there for somebody in need, and that's got to be curative. So, so your friend is at a point in her life where she need, she feels this is outside of herself and she thinks she's disempowered, she can't do it herself, and that's fine. So she needs some other symbol system outside of herself, like perhaps this uh, Jess Parker exorcism at this church, to put into a, a, a ritual, into some kind of action, that which she could actually do herself, but that's okay. That's, that gets people involved with your life. It's a good thing. All these people are paying attention to her, and so she's believing in this, that. She could believe in Jesus. She could believe in whatever. But she's getting people involved in her, her drama and her story, and she'll get this attention. And at the end, she'll empower herself and take back her life because it doesn't matter what's going on in reality. She is allowing this to happen by feeling that she's a victim and she's powerless. That's um, another. Go ahead. Uh, there's a question. Let me see what... Sean was giving me, uh, but go ahead, keep to... Well, through that. movement, then, energy moves. Mm-hmm. That's the emotions, or energy in motion, and sometimes that energy gets stuck, and you need to move it. And um, literally, squirming or writhing around is movement. Um, getting people involved in your situation is mixing it up. It's, it's getting stuff going. It's getting energy moving. And, um, you know, from an energetic standpoint... Energy is either moving or it's stuck because <laughs> energy is usually not uh, static. Um, so, did we have at a question? The, at a deepest level, sometimes in, in Gestalt therapy, particularly, we say what people fear is what they also want at some level. So, if you uh, you you fear your uh, relationship's going to break up, uh, there's that you probably have a sub self that wants to get out, that kind of thing, and so that it's really worth instead of avoiding fears and just uh, banish the fear and go for the love, uh, what we say in psychotherapy is pay attention to your fears. Let them speak to you. See what it takes to address the underlying needs that are motivating the fears. Very good. Okay, we only have like 15 minutes left. Uh, Our our question from the studio audience is, uh, do you think the government is monitoring People, uh, I say yes. Absolutely, <laughs> on multiple Absolutely. levels. Yeah. Multiple levels. So the uh, I wanted to uh, go down the line of your talking points. Questions this is a talking point. You have 
Oh, no, no. Basic techniques of cross-referencing and pattern recognition, three examples, abduction patterns, Nazi, Venusian, and Pleiadian craft similarities and spiritual overtones of contactees. What did you mean by that talking point? And I <laughs> well, those are just examples of how when you cross-reference things, you can easily glean information from it. It's very simple. We're, I think humans tend to make things more convoluted than they really need to be. But what we're, what we're, what philosophically speaking, what I've come to the conclusion is that I, in the true sense of the word, know, I can't really know anything. I think what we call to know something is within a context. And so, in the end, I think all we're really doing is we're looking for patterns, and then we're cross-referencing those patterns. To, to We're looking for patterns to glean information, then we cross-reference those patterns for further levels of information. And I just threw out a couple examples um, uh, to, to illustrate my point. Um, let's, let's take, um, I forget the ones you just listed off, but let's say channeling, for example. Um, is channeling a good thing? Is channeling a bad thing? So you review several of the channelers, and several items come to light. For example, um, many of the channelers are talking about the same things that ET contactees are talking about, that humanity is uh, on a bad course, we're killing ourselves, we're warlike, we need to monitor our thoughts, we need to clean up the pollution, we need to advance into a galactic civilization. So does that lend more credence to, so say, Bashar? If Bashar says that, I think that was he was channeled by, oh, Greg uh, or Daryl, Daryl yeah. somebody. Daryl Anka. Daryl Anka, thank you. Um, you know, if you just look at Bashar and get that message, you're like, okay, well, that's that's one guy. But if five or ten, twenty channel informations from different supposed beings are all saying that humanity needs to wake up, control its thoughts, and advance into the Galactic Federation, the Galactic Family, whatever that case may be, then that tends to lend more credence to what Bashar was saying, right? Because it's supported by all these different seemingly separate sources. Just very basic stuff, right? So do I know what Bashar is saying is true? Well, no. I don't know if I'll ever know what he's saying is true. But at some point, I have to draw the line in this fuzzy reality. And let's say there's 20 other uh, channeled uh, information streams that are all corroborative of Bashar's basic message. I would have to say that that's, at that point, you could probably draw a line and say, well, those messages are probably true now do we know the source not really but obviously something out there says that humanity is in trouble for these various reasons and i can look around and and corroborate that myself so you put all these things together and do you does that mean you know that it, that's for sure the case no i don't think you can know that truly but you drawing the line in this reality with that many corroborative sources you'd have to say well I'm just going to go with that for now, as that's what the reality is. Humanity's in in trouble. We need to work on ourselves individually and collectively in order to raise our vibration so that we can uh, get through this uh, 2D or excuse me 3D um, uh, paradigm of duality in advance to what people are saying is the fifth dimension. Okay, so it's just it's just that simple. When uh, I think one of the suggestions that you said that what I typed in for you to ask me was about different kind of craft. Well, the Venusian craft, some of them, uh, Pleiadian craft, and Nazi craft have several similarities. And so just cross-referencing those sources, you got to ask yourself, well, is there a common link between those three? Yes. Right. Okay. And so, because that seems really obvious, but, and so it's just so simple. You just cross-reference, you look for patterns, you cross-reference those patterns for deeper information, and then you decide for yourself where you draw the line in the sand to move forward with your own ritual symbolism and intention as you manifest each next moment in your life. That's that's a human that's the situation we're in right now. And we lost touch with who we are. So it's like we're dropped into this little bucket with uh, those those are the rules. We're we're manifestors. We have to wake up to ourselves so we can manifest our way out of it. And um, you know, that's I guess where people get that it's a school. Or maybe from a different perspective, a prison. So, so we're creating this consensus reality, and I think it, it works for people, yeah. for the most part. But eventually, you get to a point where uh, things are too perverse, and, and uh, we need to move into another reality. So, 
come, along comes a perturbation which shakes it all up into chaos and then it reorganizes to the higher level. And I think that's what we're having here. So we might all agree, uh, like for, for, you know, there's over, what, a billion and a half Christians and a billion and a half Muslims. And they, they are all in this reality that they kind of cross-referenced in their lives with these different beliefs from, you know, this person believed it and that person believed it and now we have this religion. And now we're all going to believe it. But there's a point where it doesn't work anymore. And I, I think that's what humanity is is looking at. We've had this consensus reality after World War II, and we had this illusion of, of you know, peace and, and security, and now it's being shaken up by the wars and rumors of war that are just uh, nightly, if you turn on television or anything, it, whatever you turn on, you, you're getting bombarded with this uh, propaganda and this paradigm that somebody wants us to believe, and they're shutting it down our throats. And so, what did you want to say, Scott? You had a, a note. Oh, it's, 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 it's sort of a minor about how these uh, three types of craft, the defense information agency that uh, Kennedy uh, created to work around the CIA because of its Nazi uh, control by Alan Dulles, uh, came up with a lot of inf interesting information that basically the Nazis were in touch with the extraterrestrials, particularly those in uh, under Antarctica, uh, and uh, were instructed on how to... Uh, Make this craft. They made some craft of, of the disc uh, craft in uh, Austria. They, uh, when the Brits tried to, uh, in 1947, the Brits tried to seal up the uh, tunnel that led to the uh, underwater lake at New Schwabenland in Antarctica, and they were uh, defeated. And they, a, a convoy was sent under Admiral Byrd with the uh, Pine Island uh, seaplane tender and lots of Marines and everything. And out of it, before they could even uh, make their three-pronged attack, uh, hovercraft came out and knocked out some of the seaplanes, killed 64 Marines, uh, Bird retreated, this is 1947. Uh, however, at the same time, there had been people from Serpo uh, with a small um, scout craft who had been looking at our uh, atomic weapons experiments at Los Alamos, and they um, one of their uh, sh craft crashed, and there was a survivor. He was treated well, and we got an exchange program with the people from Serpo. And twelve Americans went to Serpo, and they sent the Serpo and sent an ambassador who helped us construct our military, construct the hovercraft, and our clandestine military has mastered um, the uh, this these um, flying saucers as they were. Uh, for some time now, so the Nazis uh, and um, our military uh, and, and the uh, visitors from Serpo all had those same kind of craft. And we have information which isn't just uh, subjective, but it's, it's um, sort of more official leakers. <laughs> yeah, but it's suggestive of a common source, and that's... Wouldn't yeah. that be fascinating to know that all the different alien races really all had one dealership they went and bought all their craft from or something? <laughs> <laughs> they all bought from the same dealership. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Right. <laughs> okay, we have like five more minutes. Let's uh, focus on what, what do you want to tell our listeners that you think they really need to know? Well, um, other than quit paying your mortgage and electric bill, just buy all my books and DVDs. Uh, and... <laughs> Just focus on that right now. Um, um, I'm just kidding, of course. But um, I, I, you know, a UFO hunter's guide was written to try to empower people to find the answers to the UFO riddle themselves. Because in the end, I think it's a it's a spiritual, personal thing, and um, that's where the answers are really going to be. I do think that the government um, has a bunch of answers that could benefit the the human population, but it's just not in their best interest to reveal it. Um, because that involves things like anti-gravity technology or free energy machines, um, as well as heightened spirituality and uh, awareness of our of our uh, situation here on Earth. So the, at this stage, we didn't really get a chance to talk about this, but the governments all of now are what are known as golems. They've been magically created and imbued with the power of the people to do a task for the people. And inevitably, if you study the tradition of the golem, uh, the golem protects the Jewish village from the Christians, who are attacking the Jewish village because they're blaming the Jews for killing Christ. Well, so the, the rabbi goes down to the river with a couple assistants. 
They got the Zohar with them, the Kabbalah with them. They fashion a clay figure, uh, do a couple of enchantments, incantations. They bring this thing to life to do a task. Well, the problem with that kind of magic is it does exactly what it's supposed to do, except when there's the job is done, it always comes back to devour its creator. And so that's what we're seeing now with governments. We've created these governments magically through ritual, okay, by consecrations at the Washington Monument or breaking a champagne bottle at the corner of the building, whatever you want to call it. Those are all rituals. Okay, so we've consecrated this, this being into life, and now this being has, is turning on its own people. And that's where we're seeing with the government agents coming around and, and pulling people over without a warrant uh, and doing revenue generation for traffic stuff. And, and the IRS is uh, busting people. They're stealing everyone's mortgage stuff. They're, we're using this fake money script so they can just do a bank run and take everyone's retirement whenever they want. So right. it's because this beast has a life of its own. And when human beings plug into offices of the government, they, be, they start to toe the line of the larger government now for a paycheck. And so it's getting humans to undermine humanity is basically what's going on. So, um, you know, and that's what the first book's about, uh, Song in Your Heart, Story of the Search for the Lost Note. It's about the role of the roots reggae rasas in terms of a global struggle for the control of human consciousness. Um, the root, roots reggae rasa guys, they're going around playing music trying to change consciousness. Um, think about that. That's the number one weapon, according to them. Music, mm-hmm. not guns, not, not bombs. And so... Book two, Tales of a Heavy Heart, UFOs, Magic, and Impending Doom. I'm going to talk about the feminine energy. I'm going to talk about law extensively, how to get out of the corporate system. I'm going to have that remedy in my book. And part three will all be about UFOs, interdimensionals, crop circles, archons, uh, conspiracy. It'll be just a jumble of juicy goodness. So with that in mind, hit me up on Facebook, uh, Brett Luter, uh, uh, B-R-E-T-L-U-E-D-E-R. My website's been hacked when I was on Sean David Morton's show earlier this summer, and I just haven't got it back up yet. So um, thank you guys so much for, for having me on. I really appreciate it. I've enjoyed oh, our conversation. We have two minutes. We have two um, minutes. Ask a question. Uh, well, basically, I, I, I love your analysis, and uh, especially the second book, because in anthropology we say that the basic human sanction is nullity. Stop participating. I know you said that as a joke. Stop uh, but but that but that's really so to the, at whatever degree is possible. If you stop participating in institutions, uh, they fall apart. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you you so, patronize it, yeah. You give it energy. It's got energy. So the answer is buy Brett's book so you can get the answers. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not a violent method of, of overthrowing the government, but it's uh, no, of course not. Free- in the first place, so how do we unplug that which we created, which has turned into a monster, which is, the, like you said, the golem, and which is also the external being that your friend is experiencing? How can she uh, disarm her own golem that she yeah. creates? There's going to be a ritual. In other words, there's going to be a combination of ritual, symbolism, and intention that's going to provide or manifest the outcome that you desire. We just haven't found it yet for my friends, but we're working yeah, so- on it. So, in a way, our golems are our our social personalities that we fend off our own inner emotions and the realities we don't like to do. Sounds good. We'll have to have you back for the conversation. Thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate it. I'd love to come back again. Bye-bye.